is all my way Oh my soul Praise the Lord Most high Strong to say He upholds my life Forevermore He will be
Well, good morning, everyone, uh, and I'm sure they enjoyed your visit, but it's great to have you with us today, great to have all of you with us. Welcome, too, to those joining with us on our YouTube channel this morning, and whoever we are, wherever we are, we trust and look for the Lord to bless us today. Can we just bow our heads and, and begin our service with a word of prayer? Lord Jesus, as we come together today, we ask for you to be with us. We ask for you to be in our midst. We ask for you to speak. We ask for you to, to do your work in us and through us. Help us to love you more, to love one another more, and to grow in the, the gift of faith that you have given to us. So bless our time of worship. May it be acceptable in your sight, for we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me read some verses as I call to worship this morning in Psalm 91 to read the first stanza and the last stanza. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. And in the last stanza, because He loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue Him. I will protect Him, for He acknowledges my name. He will call on me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Now, these are words that are true first and foremost. They speak first and foremost of the King, the Lord Jesus Christ. But we remember too that if we trust Jesus, what is true of Jesus becomes true for us as well. We're going to begin our praise of God together this morning singing from Psalm 136 in the Scottish Psalter, 
Psalm 136. It's the second version of the psalm. If you're following in the psalm books, it's page 428. We're going to be singing verses 1 and 2. The first stanza there on the screen. And then we're going to jump across to verse 11 and sing down to verse um, 16. So it's a psalm that's going to be speaking about the Bible passage that we're going to be thinking about today where God parts the Red Sea and Moses leads the people through as on dry land, and it's referenced in the psalm that we're going to be singing here. Psalm 136, verses 1 to 2, then 11 to 16, praise God, for He is kind, His mercy lasts for a. If we're able to, let's stand and let's sing to God's praise together. Praise God, for He is kind, His mercy lasts for every. Give thanks with heart and mind to God of God always for certainly his mercy is your most firm and should eternally and he brought for his grace lasteth ever with a strong hand he wrought and stretched out and delivered for certainly his mercy is your most firm man should eternally. The sea he cut in two, for his grace lasted still, and through its midst to go made his own Ryan, for certainly his mercy is your most firm and should eternally. But overwhelmed and lost was proud king. Pharaoh, with all his might, and chariots there also, for certainly his mercy is your most firm and should Powerfully, his chosen people led in through the desert dry and in that place them fed for certainly his is your most firm and should eternally. Let's bow our heads and let's pray to the Lord together. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you are the God who acts works of great deliverance. You are the God who saves his people. We sang of you saving your people through the Red Sea. And we thank you even more this morning that you are the God who has saved us from sin and from death. You've saved us from eternal darkness. And you have opened a way where there was no way. 
You have opened the way back to you. You have opened the way to eternal life. You've taken away every obstacle that there is for us to come back to the Lord, and we thank you, and we praise you. And even as we meditate on your great works together this morning, we pray that you would open hearts and open eyes. We pray for any in here today or watching this online, either today or later, that you would, you would speak to us, Lord. For any who don't know you, that you would reveal yourself to them. And as your word says, spiritual things are spiritually discerned. And we ask you, Spirit of God, to speak loudly, clearly, to give us ears to hear, to give us eyes to see, to give us hearts to obey. Change our desires within us, Lord. You are the God both who both wills, gives us the, both the will and the motive to walk in your ways. And so we pray that you would mold our hearts and shape our hearts and help us to follow you more closely, to follow you more nearly. Always keep us close to yourself, Lord Jesus. We thank you that you are indeed the God of heaven and of earth, that the whole earth is yours. That your kingdom today is not just a kingdom here in Alness or in, in Scotland, but your kingdom extends around the whole world, that your kingdom is the kingdom that lasts. Empires have come and gone. Empires of Babylon and Persia, empires of Rome and others have risen, have looked so mighty, and have fallen. And yet the kingdom of our Lord Jesus, it endures, and it will endure eternally. And we thank you for the privilege and the wonder that we can be a, a small part of what you are doing in the world. We pray for your blessing on the meeting tonight in Dingwall. As, uh, Matty Guy leads that meeting as Lamboy shares. We do pray, Father, for your, your peace and your blessing to rest upon that. And we thank you for the opportunity to come together with various churches from around the area to hear of what you are doing. We pray that you would bless our nation, Lord. We live in a nation that, that needs you. And we ask that you would help us as the church to, to be a city upon a hill that cannot be hidden, to be salt and to be a light that shines in the darkness. Help us to stand up and to, to really be the people you have called us to be. We know that persecution will come when we follow you. For we wrestle not with flesh and blood, but with principalities and powers in the heavenly places. And so in that regard, we pray that you would push back the powers and the authorities, those corrupt powers in the spiritual realm that work against you and your people and the church, and that you would do your work. You have promised that you will build your church, and the very gates of hell cannot prevail against it. As we so we heard the news also yesterday, Lord, of the passing of, of Alex Salmond, one who was such a, a huge figure in our national life, whatever opinions we may have one way or the other. We do remember his family today, and we do give you thanks for, for good that he has done, and for what has not been good, we are reminded, Lord, that he was but a sinner just like the rest of us. Man at his best is at best a man, and today he finds himself in eternity. We are reminded of the fragility of life. One minute delivering a speech, the next minute his soul was required of him. We are all ever but a breath from eternity, Lord Jesus, so help, help us. May our souls be safe. May our sin be forgiven through putting our trust in you. And again, we pray for any watching this or here today who don't yet know you, who are still in danger, that you would bring them into the safety of your kingdom, of your presence, and that you would stretch out your wings over them. So bless us around your word today, we pray, for we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning, boys and girls. You know what I'm going to say. 
hardly hear you. Louder. Good morning, boys and girls. That's slightly better. How are we all today? Good. Smiths didn't say anything. You guys okay? Yeah, yeah, good. I like to hear it. Now, you know the deal. You ready? One, two, three. Right, I've got a puzzle for you this morning. Two things, and you need to tell me what they have in common, okay? Can you see it? What's this, Jamie? And what's this, Charlie? Close? It's a 20 pound note. What do they have in common? Maybe don't look at it closely enough, but see if you get cash. Cash is not that you probably see cash these days, it's all card. But paper money is actually a promise. There's a little bit of text, a wee blurb up here. And it says, the Bank of Scotland promises to pay the bearer on demand 20 pounds. Actually, this is just a bit of paper, but it's a promise that it's worth 20 pounds. And what promise is the rainbow about? Can anyone remember that? Lucy. That's right. It was after Noah and the flood, wasn't it? That God put a rainbow in the sky that never again would he destroy the world with a flood like he did with Noah. Have you guys ever made a promise? Hands up if you've made promises. Anyone want to tell me a promise they've made? Rudy, to clean your room. Dad, is his room clean? Mm. Anyone else promises you've made? Charlie, what were you going to say? I thought you were going to say I was going to help Rudy clean his room. <laughs> you would help clear the table. Hands up. <laughs> See if you're brave enough to admit this. Have you ever broken a promise? I'm going to put my hand up. I won't ask you what promises you've broken. Hands up too if anyone's ever broken a promise to you. Have you ever gone, I'm sure mom and dad don't do this, but mom, you promised. You ever said that? Yeah, I won't ask you just to name and shame either, so don't worry, moms and dads. How did you feel, though, when a promise was broken to you? How did it make you feel? Charlie, sad. It's not very nice, and it can be really horrible and hurtful when promises get broken to us. Does God ever break His promises? What do you think, Olive? Does God break His promises? No, absolutely not. One of the the ways God describes himself as, I, as he says, I am faithful, that he can be trusted, that other people will break promises to us, and we can still break promises to others, but God will never break his promises to us. He is faithful. So, he wants you to know that today. When God says something to you, he means it. Every promise you read of in the Bible that He'll be with you, that He'll help you, that He loves you, that He protects you, that He provides for you, God will never break His promises to you, and you can trust that, and you can rely on that because God is faithful. But when we follow Jesus, one of the things He wants us to be is people who are faithful too, because He wants us to be like Him. He wants us to be a people who are faithful to our promises. Now, what have we been learning about over the last five weeks or whatever it is? Rudy? The Ten Commandments. What number are we on, Lucy? The number? You can't remember. I'll give you a clue. It's between six and eight. You had to think about that for a minute. It's between six and eight. We're on number seven. Does anyone know what the seventh commandment is? I'll give you a clue. It starts off with do not. This is a total aside, but have you ever heard of the Wicked Bible? It was a King James Bible that had a, a misprint in it back in the day that when they printed the Ten Commandments, they forgot the word not. So, so it said, do steal, do commit adultery, do. So it, 
If you lay your hands on one of these, they're, they're very valuable commodities these days. But it says, do not commit adultery, okay? Do not commit adultery. So this is all to do with our relationships, okay? It's to do with our relationships. And the commandment is calling us to be faithful in our relationships. It's calling us to be faithful in particular to those that we were going to be in a relationship with. Be faithful to that person. Have you ever been to a wedding, boys and girls? When the two people stand up at the front, what, what did they do up the front? Did, did you ever notice they had to say something? What was it? Lucy? I do. What were they asked to do, though? Do you remember? Well, usually at a wedding, the groom will be there, the bride will be there, and we'll ask them to take vows. And the vows usually go along these lines that do you promise to be a faithful husband in the good times and the bad times, in sickness and in health, for richer, for poorer, for better, for worse? And then you say the same to the bride. Do you promise to be faithful in good times and bad times, sickness and health, richer, poorer, better, or worse? we're saying to each other, we're going to be faithful. We're going to be committed. I quoted a great philosopher in the Bible study this morning. You might be familiar with this great philosopher, familiar with his work. His name is Ali McCoist, who once said, we don't do walking away. And in essence, that's what happens in, when we take these vows. We're saying, I'm committed to you, and I'm going to be committed to you forever. Now, we're called as God's people to be people who keep our promises. We live in a difficult world, boys and girls, so sometimes hard things happen, and sometimes when others are not faithful to their promises, that can be really difficult for us. But when that happens, we're called to remember that the Bible actually pictures our faith in Jesus like a relationship. He is the bridegroom, and we are His bride that He loves, and He will always be faithful to us. He doesn't walk away. He doesn't give up on us. He's always there, always loving, always forgiving. But He calls us to be a faithful as much as we can in a, with sinful hearts and a sinful world to be people who are faithful to our promises as well. Now, we're going to remember our, there's a sign for this as well. Do you remember our little sign so far? Are you going to do this with me? Now, first commandment, God number one. You'll have no other gods before me. Number two, don't make idols to bow down to them or worship them. Number three, it's like a W, watch your words. Don't take the name of God in vain. Number four, do you remember? Oh, thumb is sleepy. You're wrong way around, Jamie. That's it. Number four, to have a day of rest, to remember the Sabbath day, have a day of rest. Number five, it's like taking your scout's pledge, honor your father and your mother. Remember number six was like a gun pointing? Do not kill, do not murder. And number seven, the one we're going to learn today, I want you one hand with five fingers out flat, and then like a bride and groom standing on it. Number seven. So let's go through them from the beginning again. Number one, God, number one. Number two, don't make idols to bow down to them or worship them. Number three, watch your words. Number four, oh, have a day of rest. Number five, honor your father and your mother. Number six, no murdering. Number seven, do not commit adultery. Excellent, boys and girls. You've listened really well. And actually, I forgot to say at the start, and I should have mentioned this at the very start, there are sermon note sheets available for the young folks during the service today. So if you haven't got one of these and you would like one, put your hand up. If anyone didn't get one and they would like one, Perfect, you all got them. That's all I wanted to check. Now, we're going to sing again now. We're going to sing the hymn. I'm not entirely sure which name it has. Is it Across the Lands or is it You're the Word of God the Father? But we'll go for You're the Word of God the Father. It's the first verse is there on your screen. You're the Word of God the Father from before the world began. Every star and every planet has been fashioned by your hand. Let's stand.
You're the word of God the Father from before the world began. For every star and every planet has been fashioned by your hand. All creation holds together by the power of your voice. Let the skies declare your glory. Let the land and seas rejoice. We're going to read God's Word now. We're going to read from the Bible, and we're going to read from the end of Exodus chapter 13. So Exodus, it's the second book of your Bible, so it's way back at the beginning, Exodus chapter 13, and we're going to read from verse 17, and then we're going to read all the way through to the end of chapter 14. So, this is following on from what we'd seen last week. So, God has sent these ten plagues on Egypt, culminating in this spectacular, devastating plague, the the tenth plague, the death of the firstborn. And after that, Pharaoh has said to the Israelites, go. You've been slaves in Egypt now. He says, go, get out. You're free. So, Exodus chapter 13 at verse 17. When Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them on the road through the Philistine country, though that was shorter. For God said, if they face war, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. So God led the people around by the desert road towards the Red Sea. The Israelites went up out of Egypt ready for battle. Moses took the bones of Joseph with him, because Joseph had made the Israelites swear an oath. He had said, God will surely come to your aid, and then you must carry my bones up with you from this place. After leaving Succoth, they camped at Etham on the edge of the desert. By day, the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, so that they could travel by day or by night. Neither the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night left its place in front of the people. Then the Lord said to Moses, Tell the Israelites to turn back and encamp near Pi Hahiroth between Migdol and the sea. They are to encamp by the sea directly opposite Baal Zephon. Pharaoh will think the Israelites are wandering around the land in confusion, hemmed in by the desert, and I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will pursue them. But I will gain glory for myself through Pharaoh and all his army. And the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. So the Israelites did this. When the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, 
Pharaoh and his officials changed their minds about them and said, what have we done? We have let the Israelites go and have lost their services. So he had his chariot made ready and took his army with him. He took 600 of the best chariots, along with all the other chariots of Egypt, with officers over all of them. The Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, so that he pursued the Israelites who were marching out boldly. The Egyptians, all Pharaoh's horses and chariots, horsemen and troops, pursued the Israelites and overtook them as they camped by the sea near Pai Hahiroth, opposite Baal Zephon. As Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up, and there were the Egyptians marching after them. They were terrified and cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, was it because there was no graves in Egypt that you brought us out to the desert to die? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone, let us serve the Egyptians? It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. Moses answered the people, do not be afraid. Stand firm and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you and you need only to be still. Then the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to move on. Raise your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea to divide the water so that the Israelites can go through the sea on dry ground. I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so they will go in after them, and I will gain glory through Pharaoh and all his army through his chariots and his horsemen. The Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I gain glory through Pharaoh, his chariots, and his horsemen. Then the angel of God who had been traveling in front of Israel's army withdrew and went behind them. The pillar of cloud also moved from in front and stood behind them, coming between the armies of Egypt and Israel. Throughout the night, the cloud brought darkness to the one side and light to the other side, so neither went near the other all night long. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and all that night the Lord drove the sea back with a strong east wind and turned it into dry land. The waters were divided, and the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with a wall of water on their right and on their left. The Egyptians pursued them, and all Pharaoh's horses and chariots and horsemen followed them into the sea. During the last watch of the night, the Lord looked down from the pillar of fire and cloud at the Egyptian army and threw it into confusion. He jammed the wheels of their chariots so they had difficulty driving. And the Egyptians said, let's get away from the Israelites. The Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea so that the waters may flow back over the Egyptians and their chariots and horsemen. Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and at daybreak the sea went back to its place. The Egyptians were fleeing towards it, and the Lord swept them into the sea. The water flowed back and covered the chariots and horsemen. The entire army of Pharaoh that had followed the Israelites into the sea, not one of them survived. But the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground, with a wall of water on their right and on their left. That day the Lord saved Israel from the hands of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians lying dead on the shore. And when the Israelites saw the mighty hand of the Lord displayed against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord and put their trust in Him and in Moses, His servant. Amen. May God bless the reading of His own Word to us. Before we look at that together, we're going to sing again, this time from Psalm 77. The Sing Psalms version of the psalm, it's Psalm 77, and we're going to be singing verses 13 to 20. O God, most holy are your ways, what God compares with you, you are the God of miracles, whose power the nations view. Psalm 77, 13 to 20, and we can stand to sing. O God, most holy are your ways, what God compares with 
Again, let's just bow our heads. Lord, as we come to your word, I ask for grace to rightly handle the word of truth. And I ask for your spirit to accompany with power. May the words of my lips and the meditations of my heart be pleasing in your sight, Lord. May your voice speak. May you build us up. This is your word. And we ask that you would open it to us and speak to hearts and lives today. For we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Now please turn back in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 14. We're coming today to one of the most well-known, one of the most famous miracles of the Bible. God rescues His people in just an, uh, an impossible way. There seemed to be no way out. There seemed to be no escape. And God performs this amazing miracle where He parts the waters and the people go through on dry land. We have a God who makes the impossible possible. We have a God who makes a way where there is no way. We have a God who tames the untamable. Our God is the Lord of heaven and earth, and He's a God who does the greater impossibility. He's a God who can both give sin what it deserves and forgive sinners. He's opened a way to us back to Himself. I know we are 21st century Scots who are naturally inclined to be skeptical of miracles, and yet this is a miracle. I read quite a funny story of a, a liberal preacher in America who didn't believe in miracles, and he, he read the passage, and he was in 
quite a charismatic church, and as he read it, they shouted out, praise the Lord, the wonder-working miracle of parting the sea. And he said, well, well, we don't actually think it was a, a sea. We think it was more likely a marsh with six inches of water, to which they replied, praise the Lord for drowning the Egyptians in six inches of water. He wasn't very pleased at that response. But we do believe in miracles because God is a God who does the impossible. And as we read about this miracle of parting the Red Sea, we'll see that God's salvation is, is a two-edged sword. As much as it's good news for those who trust Him, it's bad news for those who reject Him. With salvation, the other side of that coin is condemnation for those who reject the Lord Jesus. The Red Sea was good news for the Israelites, but it was not good news if you were an Egyptian. And I should probably caveat that because there was many Egyptians who actually went with the Israelites from the Exodus. So some Egyptians did go through the, would have gone through the Red Sea and be saved, but those who rejected the Lord, who fought against the Lord, were lost. The miracle of the Red Sea is reminding us that all our choices that we make in life are roads that lead to an ultimate destination. You and I are on a road that is heading somewhere, it's heading to an eternal destination. And the question is, where are you going? What road are you traveling? There's a broad road, the Bible says, that leads to destruction. And there's a narrow road, the way that, of following Jesus that leads to life. Pharaoh had chosen a road of hardening his heart to God or rejecting God, and that was the choices he made ultimately led to his destruction. The Israelites trusted in God, they did what God said, they followed the Lord, and they ultimately led to be saved. The choices that we make in life determine where we will be for eternity. What road are you on? What destination is waiting for you at the end of that road? Throughout our study so far in the life of Moses, we've seen there's been this emphasis on nailing our colors to the mast and making a, a commitment, a decisive decision as to what people we belong to. Do we belong to the family of God and so we'll listen to God, or are we going to reject that? What road are we walking? What outcome are we heading to? So we've got three headings as usual today. Don't worry, the first two are quite long. The third one is not long at all. So we're going to look at a roundabout road. We're going to see a Red Sea road. And then we're going to see a right response. Okay, so there's a roundabout road, a Red Sea road. And then really the last point is just a word of challenge, a question to put to us. So first of all, in a roundabout road, the story so far has been dramatic. After 430 years, God has delivered His people Israel from slavery. A slave, a slavery. Easy for me to say. There's, you see that through these ten plagues, God has been showing Pharaoh that He is God. They were judgments on the gods of Egypt. The Lord was showing that these gods that the Egyptians worshipped were no god at all. He was the God who had sovereignty and power over land, sea, sky, and heavens. He was the creator of all things, the most high God. And you still see that emphasis actually in the passage. It's quite interesting. Did you notice that when the waters come back over the Egyptians, it's a daybreak, which is symbolic in Egypt because they worship Ra, the sun god, who was responsible for bringing the sun up. Pharaoh was often thought to be a god who caused the sun to rise. So, at this moment of, you could say, the power of Egyptian gods, God shows they have no power at all, and He brings the waters crashing back over them. And the text itself draws our attention specifically to that, to when this happened. God has shown the Egyptians, He has shown Pharaoh that He is the Lord, He is Yahweh, He is the Creator, He is God. And then Pharaoh has set after the ten plagues, Pharaoh has told the people to go. The Israelites leave, and we're told even the Egyptians give them gold and silver and clothing. Effectively, they're saying, we'll pay you to go. After refusing to let them go, they're now paying them to get out. And so they go with all this wealth of Egypt. Imagine how happy they would be. They've been slaves, and now they're being set free. They're leaving Egypt. They've got gold. They've got silver. They've got expensive clothing. And you've got God there right in front of you, a pillar of cloud by day 
and a pillar of fire by night. When the pillar moved, they moved. When the pillar stopped, they stopped. How good would that be? There's guidance. No need for a sat-nav or anything like that. There was God right in front of them, leading them. You could say, well, where is God? He's there. You could see Him. The Lord Himself led them, not, and I probably have already made this mistake, it doesn't say He led them as a pillar of cloud or fire. It says He led them in the cloud and the fire. And actually, that cloud and fire later on, when God comes down on Mount Sinai, you see, these are signs that accompany the presence of God. When He came down on Mount Sinai, a cloud covered the mountain, fire covered the mountain, there was thunder, there was lightning. These are signs that accompany His presence. And then verse, chapter 13, verse 17, it says, when Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them on the road through the Philistine country, though that was shorter. For God said if they face war, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. So God led the people around the desert road towards the Red Sea. It says God took them on a surprising route. He didn't take the most direct route. Have you ever had that? You put your Google Maps on and it says, this is the direct route and it'll take you X amount of time to get to your destination. And it shows you a couple of alternatives that might say plus 10 minutes or plus 20 minutes if you take these different routes, these diversions. So, Moses is saying God didn't take them on the direct route, the shortest route, the quickest route. And he says, why? Because that would have led them through the territory of the Philistines. There would have been conflict. There would have been warfare. And God leads them instead on the desert road, a longer route towards the Red Sea. But the way God chose itself was not without its challenges. He's going to lead them into a situation where there was no way out. They couldn't go back because Pharaoh's army was there, and they couldn't go forward because the Red Sea was there, this body of water that they couldn't cross. And the Lord actually directs them into this situation. Did you notice that at the beginning of chapter 14? He says, tell the Israelites to turn back. So, they're turning back there it is on the screen, and encamp near pi between Migdol and the sea. They're to encamp by the sea directly opposite Baal Zephon. So, not only is it a circuitous route, the Lord actually orders them to go back on themselves, and it's in this very place that the Lord orders them to go to that Pharaoh's army is going to catch up to them. It tells us that later on in the passage in verse 9, the Egyptians pursued the Israelites and overtook them as they camped by the sea near Pai Hahiroth, opposite Baal Zephon. The Lord is leading them directly, and He leads them into this situation where they can't go back and they can't go forwards. If we were one of the Exodus generation, now what, what would we be thinking at this point? We'd be thinking, what's going on here? We'd be thinking, what's going on? For a couple of reasons, you'd be thinking, first of all, oh, I thought we were free, and we've only been gone a couple of days, and now we're stuck, and there's an army about to kill us. We thought the good times were going to roll, and already there's testing, there's trials, and there's challenges. There's more conflict. We thought things were going to be easy from here on in, and here we are facing this huge test. And isn't that so true sometimes to our own experience following Jesus? When I went into ministry, someone gave me a wee plaque that had words on it that rang and still ring very true. It said, the Lord never promised it would be easy, but He did promise to go with you every step of the way. Jesus never promises us that life will be easy. Never. He says the opposite. In this world, you will have trouble. But what He does promise us, that He will be with us, that He protects us, He guides us, He leads us, He provides for us, and that His goodness and His mercy in the good times and in the bad times will follow us, and He will bring us through the other side. We have a Lord, as Psalm 23 tells us, who leads us through green pastures, but also leads us through dark and scary valleys, but He leads us through, and He leads us ultimately to the Father's house, where we will be with Him forever. And like the Israelites, we can find ourselves in situations where we cry, 
where are you, Lord? Why are you doing this? Why am I here? Why me? Why this? Why now? And we can feel like there's no way out. But God knows what He's doing. And yes, He may bring us into dark and difficult situations, but here's His promise. And if you find yourself in one of these situations today, here's His promise. He may lead us into them, but He doesn't leave us there. He doesn't leave us there. He will take us through. Keep trusting Him. Keep looking to Him. Keep following Him. He will take us through. Like the Israelites, we may question what we're doing. Notice the Israelites' response is to go, ha, huh, it would have been better for us to stay slaves in Egypt. We've just followed the Lord and we're just going to leave us dead in the desert. We're in far better in, in our slavery and in our misery in Egypt. Funny how quickly they've, they've, they've switched. But the Lord was going to show them that He was with them. And not even all Pharaoh's army was a match for him. Even if we find ourselves in a dark valley and in a testing situation, if we have the Lord with us as He promises that He is with us, it's still the safest place to be. Through this trial, through this miracle, God was going to show them that their greatest enemy, their greatest danger was not Pharaoh, it was not the Philistines, it wasn't the people of Canaan. What was the Israelites' greatest enemy? What's you and I's greatest enemy? Ourselves. The Israelites' greatest enemy was their hearts of unbelief and sin. Our greatest enemy is our heart of unbelief and sin. And the Lord was going to show them that in this moment, He was going to help them to understand themselves. But even more than that, He was going to help them to understand who He was. And it's interesting to me that if they hadn't gone this way, the Red Sea miracle wouldn't have happened. And the miracle of the Red Sea didn't just strengthen their faith, it strengthened the faith of generations of Israelites to come. That's why we sang two Psalms. It was in the songbook of Israel. Do you see what this, he's saying? This is what God did for our ancestors' generation. We can trust that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So actually, by bringing them into this difficult situation, He would show them, help them understand their own hearts and the danger of their own sin and unbelief, and He was going to show them His God's saving power. They would know God better through this than if they'd never come to this at all. And the Lord fought for them. The Lord took them. The Lord that took them there would take them through it. And the same is true for you and for me. He does not abandon us. He cannot abandon us. He is faithful. So though the road God leads us on will be confusing, there will be twists, there will be turns, He'll take us directions we would never want to go or choose to go. If we follow the Lord, He will lead us through, and He's going to lead us to life. It's a roundabout road. Secondly, it's a Red Sea road. Pharaoh and his armies catch up to Israel, and what a terrifying sight. We're told he had 600 of his best chariots. Chariots are kind of like the tank division of the day. 600 of the best and all the other chariots of Egypt. Horsemen, officers over them all. This is, Egypt was probably, certainly not if the military superpower of the day was one of the military superpowers, and this army has caught them. Now, the Israelites probably barely had a sword or a weapon between them. They were slaves who left Egypt. They were not an army. And even if they were, they, they didn't have chariots. It's like a squadron of, or platoon of infantry against a tank division. It's not going to go well. They're terrified, and Moses speaks to the people, and he says, Don't be afraid. Stand firm and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. I love that. There's an army, army behind them, a sea in front of them, and Moses says, you're not going to have to do anything. The Lord will fight for you. You just need to be still. The Lord takes charge. Again, notice how the angel of God 
Remember the angel of God? He appeared to Moses in the burning bush. Do you remember that? The angel, likely a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus, God's Son. And he goes from in front of the people to behind the people. I love that image. To get to the Israelites, Pharaoh's got to go through the angel of God. That's what Jesus says. You want to touch my people, you have to go through me. And no one's getting through that. And then it's in verse 19, it says, the pillar of cloud also moved. See the distinction? It speaks of the angel of God as separate to the cloud. The pillar of cloud also moved from in front and stood behind them, coming between the armies of Egypt and Israel. Through the night, the cloud brought darkness to one side, and it brought light to the other. Remember how we're told there was a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night? What do we find here? It's both at the same time. That's the only way that makes sense. It's cloud to the Egyptians that brings darkness. It's fire that brings light to the Israelites. And so all night, neither party comes close to each other. And the Lord tells Moses to raise his staff to stretch it out over the waters of the sea. And all night, a strong east wind blows and the waters part. Dry land appears in the middle and there's these walls of water on both sides. Hands up who would be confident enough to go through that be quite something, wouldn't it? Standing there at the seashore, you see these walls of water, and there's a stretch of land. There's at least 600,000 male Israelites, plus women and children, plus the Egyptians and other nationalities who came out with them. This is not going to be a quick crossing. Not sure I'd be leading the charge. But led by Moses, through the people go. They walk through the dry land, through these two walls of water, and they get to the other side safe. What an experience. Presumably quite muddy underfoot, but imagine just seeing these water, walls of water at your side as you, as you cross through. I always remember a, a Tim Keller sermon illustration when he said, I bet some of the Israelites went through there terrified. It's going to, if they would have been the Israelite version of, what was that character from Dad's Army? We're doomed. Do you remember him? We're doomed. They would have just been waiting for the water. It's going to come crashing down on us. I'll tell you, it's going to come crashing down. We're going to die. This is a bad idea. Some would have gone through nervous and terrified. Some probably skipped their way through going, isn't this amazing what the Lord has done? And Tim Keller asked the question, which of them were saved? And the answer is, all of them. All of them. Because their salvation didn't depend upon their assurance. It didn't depend on their confidence. It depended upon what the Lord had done. So those who were nervous and anxious and afraid were saved. Those who were full of confidence and assurance were saved. And it's the same with our faith in Jesus. Some of us might have that full assurance and confidence of, of who we are in Jesus. Some of us might be nervous and anxious and timid and afraid. But if our faith is in Jesus, even as a grain of mustard seed, we're all going to be saved. Because it depends not upon us, but upon him. Pharaoh's army tries to follow them through the Red Sea. Their chariots get bogged down in the mud, and once all the Israelites are through, God says to Moses, stretch out your staff upon the waters, and it comes crashing back down upon Pharaoh and his army. Not one of them was saved. So what's this saying to us? Well, it's pointing us forward to what Jesus, the Lord Jesus, does for us. Two things I want us to see about it. It's saying to us that the Israelites could not do this for themselves, could they? Behind was an army that meant death. In front of them was a body of water they could not cross. They could not move. They could not make a way. They could not do this. It was an impossibility. And the other thing is what the Moses says to the people is when he says, the Lord will fight for you. You need to do nothing. Just be still. And this speaks to us about what Jesus has done. You see, when it comes to our getting to heaven, when it comes to us being saved, to have eternal life, we cannot make a way ourselves. There was no way for us to get back to God. There was no way for our sin to be dealt with. We can't get to heaven by being good. We can't get to heaven by doing good. We can't get to heaven by our own cleverness or because of, of who our family is or any organizations that we might belong to or because of any achievements we might have in this life or any wealth that we might accumulate. 
When it comes to getting back to God, to having eternal life, we were like the Israelites. We could not make a way. It was impossible until the Lord did what was seemingly impossible. God Himself became a man and came into this world to open up the way for us to come home, to open up a way where there was no way. And He comes and lives the life that we owe God and we don't live. He is made sin on the cross for you and for me. He is punished in our place as our substitute. He dies for our mess. He dies for us, and He rises from the dead, and the way is open. As Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. Jesus has made the way for us to have our sin forgiven, to have eternal life in His name, and to come home. There is a way back to God for you and for me this morning. There is a way that you and I can have our sin forgiven this morning. There is a way that we can have eternal life this morning, and it's through putting our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, by committing to Him, to follow Him. I wonder this morning, do you see what's so amazing about Jesus? If not, again, I challenge you, pray and ask God to open your eyes that you might see why so many of us are so excited about Jesus. And God will answer that prayer, and God will show you. I believe that. Moses said to the people, the Lord will fight for you. You need do nothing. When it comes to making a way for us to come back to God, Jesus has done it all. He's done everything that is needed. Nothing is left undone. He says, it is finished. And He offers us to us forgiveness and eternal life as a gift that all we have to do is receive it. All we have to do is take the gift that He's offering to us. And in His coming into the world, Jesus was fighting for us. He fought for you and He fought for me. He came and He took our side, our advocate, who fought for our salvation, who fought for our forgiveness, who fought for us to be with Him forever. In His life and in His death, He was fighting for you and for me that we might be saved. He went to fight for you. He went to die for you. He came to live for you. And He's opened the way back to God. As you'll see in the story, they all tried to travel the way, didn't they? The Israelites and the Egyptians, they all tried to walk the way. But only the Lord's people made it. Life for one, death for the other. Only those who belong to the Lord find life, eternal life. Do you belong to Him? Which people do you belong to? Is He your God? Is He your Savior? As we said, God's salvation in the Bible is a double-edged sword. For those who accept Him, there's life. For those who reject Him, there's condemnation. There's light to one. Remember, it speaks of heaven as a place of light. There's no night there. There's no need for the sun or moon because God provides the light, and hell is spoken of as a place of eternal darkness. Light dark, life, death, salvation, judgment. And it all hinges on what response we make to the Lord Jesus. What road are you walking? What decisions are you making? What choices are you making? What outcome are those choices leading to? Life, life to one, death to the other. Now, this is going to sound like a weird aside, but bear with me, it is relevant a quiz question in our WhatsApp group this morning. Some Jewish rabbis in their writings on the parting of the Red Sea suggest that there was fruit trees lining the way. Where on earth did they get that from? And I can see by the expression on some of your faces, you're thinking exactly what I thought when I read that and thought, that's nuts. Now, bear, disclaimer, I don't actually think there were fruit trees. But the reason they said that was really interesting, and I think they see a pattern in the story that, to be honest, I didn't see, and maybe many of us didn't see either. There's method in their madness. What they see in the story is an echo of Genesis chapter 1, the creation account. Bear with me. Remember how the Genesis account begins? In the beginning, God created the heavens and earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, 
there was this dark, watery world, is what we're introduced to. And God spoke and He said, let there be light. And He separates the light and the darkness. Remember the story? The cloud moved behind the armies, the, behind the Israelites. It was dark to one, light to the other. Darkness, light. God made an east wind blow over the sea, which blew all night and parted the waters. There's one Hebrew word that means spirit, wind, and breath. It's probably the one Hebrew word I remember because it's ruach. Norman's laughing. He said, the word in Gaelic for someone from Point where, where we're from is ruach and Chrissy as well. So the Hebrew word ruach means spirit, wind, breath. Remember Genesis 1? The spirit, the ruach of God hovered over the waters. In the Red Sea account, the wind, the ruach blows over the waters. Day two of creation in Genesis, God separates the waters above from the waters below. What does He do in the Red Sea? He separates the waters. What's next in the Genesis account? Dry land appears. What's next in the Red Sea account? Dry land appears. So this is where the rabbis are going. They follow the pattern and they go, what's next in the creation account? Vegetation. So that's, why, that's where they're coming from. But do you see the pattern? Do you see what God is saying? He's showing Himself to be the Creator. He's shown Himself in the ten plagues to be the Creator. And He is saying, if we will acknowledge our Creator, put our faith in our Creator, there is life. But if we reject our Creator, there is death. And there's actually symbolism in that. The waters come crashing back over Pharaoh in Egypt who rejected his Creator. And that takes us back to Genesis 1 as well. It's an act of decreation. Pharaoh and his army, they end up in the darkness covered by the stormy waters. Genesis 1.1, there was darkness over the face of the deep. Pharaoh rejects his Creator. He's in the dark, destroyed. Israel acknowledged their Creator and find life. God was saying to Egypt, I am the one God who does it all. I judge the gods of Egypt. I am the God of heaven, land, sea, and sky, the one God who is worthy of your worship. And if we will see that, and if we will acknowledge that, there is life. But if we reject that, the outcome is darkness and death. Finally, a right reaction. In chapter 14, verse 31, it says, the Israelites saw the mighty hand of the Lord displayed against the Egyptians, and the people feared the Lord and put their trust in Him and in Moses, His servant. You and I have not experienced the ten plagues. We've not been slaves in Egypt, and as far as I know, we haven't parted the waters of the Red Sea or the Minch or the Cromarty Firth or anything similar to that. But we have abundant evidence and witness that there is a God. The Bible says that the world around us is enough evidence to prove that God exists, that He is powerful, that He is real. The very existence of life and the universe testifies to a Creator. And we have the abundant witness of history, Scripture, and the church that life, death, and the resurrection of Jesus is central. He is the Lord God come into the world, the Lord God who has opened up a way, the Lord God who offers us life in His name and only in His name, and the God who loves us and who Himself went into the darkness for us. But the question is, what response will we give to Him? How are you and I responding to the God who made us, to our Creator, who has shown us who He is? who's showing us again this morning who He is, and is calling us to trust Him, like the Israelites, to fear the Lord and to put our trust in Him. Will we do that? Or like Pharaoh, will we harden our hearts and reject our Creator? There is a way to life, but it's only possible through the Lord Jesus. What is your response going to be to Jesus today? He has made a way. The way is open to find life but the way is only through life, through, through trusting in His name and in following Him. Will you take the way? What choice will you make? What road are you walking? Come to put your trust in the Lord Jesus today. Amen. Let's bring our service to a close this morning. We're going to sing. 
We're going to sing praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. So, you'll see the words there on the screen. We've been thinking about the God of creation that saved the Israelites and destroyed the Egyptians, and let's sing to His praise now together. Let's stand to sing. <coughs> bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn His face towards you and give you peace. And all God's people said, Amen.
can just mention a couple of notices. Please do remember that there is no 5.30 p.m. service this evening, uh, because we're going to be joining with a number of other churches, free churches, and other denominations together in Dingwall Free Church tonight at 6 p.m., so we hope you might be able to join with us uh, in Dingwall this evening. Uh, I'm not going to go through all the notices. You'll be glad to know there's quite a lot in there, just to mention um, a couple of things. God willing, our next invitation service and congregational lunch will be on Sunday the 27th of October. There'll be sign-up sheets for the lunch available um, next week if you're able to bring something. But please do be thinking of inviting folks and bringing folks along to that. So it's invitation service and lunch on the 27th um, of October. Uh, again, draw your attention to the, the Blytheswood collection and the items are still outstanding needed for that you can help with that. And hard to believe we're seeing this already, but Christmas unwrapped. We hope God willing to have the local primary schools with us on, let me get the dates right, Monday the 2nd and Tuesday the 3rd of December. Um, But we're hoping to get a team together well before that, so we know where we are and we're able to get PVG checks if PVG checks are necessary. So if you can help for both days, for one day, for part of one day, uh, please um, speak to myself. It'd be great to get a team together early uh, and to be praying ahead for all the school kids who will be coming along to hear about the Christmas story. Please do read through your bulletins. There's plenty other bits and pieces um, there. But there's one last thing I need to mention is that you know, I'm told today is a special day for someone here. Uh, it's Billy Ross's 90th birthday today. Doesn't look a day over 89. So, we have a card and a gift for you here, Billy. I'm going to ask Wilden, if Wilden will come and take this down to you. There's a wee card and a gift for us, from us, not for us. There is a cake. It's already through in the church hall for the teas and coffees. We were going to bring it through with candles on it, but the new fire officer said no. (laughs) Dangerous when you get to 90. But a very happy birthday from us all, Billy, and uh, we've continued to pray God's blessing on yourself and on Mina. So that is all uh, our notices uh, for this morning. Thank you all. Thank you those joining with us on YouTube this morning. God bless you.